In today's Datagraph demo, I'm going to show you how to do a global parameter fit to a set of experimental data. This is where we're not just fitting one curve, but we're fitting this entire experiment all at once. The example that we're going to use is fitting data with the Michaelis-Menten equation. This is an equation that is often fit by linearizing the data and is done in multiple steps. And the way that I'm going to show you how to do this in Datagraph lets you do this just in one step. So it's much easier. And there's a number of articles out there that actually recommend this as a better way to fit this data. Uh, so that's the example that we're going to do today. In fact, we're going to fit the data that was first published in 1913 by Maud Menton and Leonore Michaelis, and we can compare the results that we get today in Datagraph to what they got back in 1913 without the aid of computers. If you don't have Datagraph, you can download a trial version right now and you can follow along with us. And if this video is helpful for you and you appreciate this, then please give us a like. Uh, let's get started. The first thing I'd recommend you do is to download this example file. This is what I'm going to walk through during this video. You can get it by going to File, Online Examples, go to the Analysis section, and the name of this is Global Fit to Kinetic Equations. There are three graphs that I'm going to walk you through. We'll start by talking a little bit about the data, and I'll show you how I created this graphic of the data itself. Then we're going to go ahead and do the global fit. And finally, we'll do a plot of the results themselves that you can see here. And if anyone's interested in the details of the equations, I also have that presented in this file. Let me take a moment just to talk about where I got the data and a little bit about what it means. If you go over to the data side panel, there is a note associated with this data group that gives you a link to a translated copy of the original Michaelis Menten paper. The original was done in German, uh, but in 2011, Johnson and Goody published a translated version and also an analysis that they did of the Michaelis Menten paper, and the link to that is also given. The experimental system that Michaelis and Menten studied was an enzymatic reaction where sucrose is being converted into glucose and fructose. And in fact, the michaelis menten equation is not an equation that they derived. The equation had already been published and derived by someone else, but they recognized the importance of the hydrogen ion concentration in their experiments, and they controlled for that, and they conducted this set of experiments that came up with this set of data that you see here, where they looked at various sucrose concentrations as their starting concentration of their substrate, and then preceded these reactions to get different product concentrations as each of these reactions proceeded. And using this data and doing a bunch of mathematics, they were able, again, to fit this equation, what we know, now know as the Michaelis-Menten equation to this data. Notice that on the y-axis here, this is the product concentration divided by our starting concentration. So when this is one, it means the reaction has proceeded all the way to the end. Now, one thing to note here is that I have the data plotted on a log axis. If you want to control click, right click, or two fingers on your touchpad, you can get the context menu, change this to a linear scale. You can then click and drag on the graph if you want to zoom in on this a little bit more and just see what this looks like. Again, not in logarithmic terms, but in linear terms. Sometimes that makes it a little easier for me, I know, to kind of understand conceptually what's going on. So again, you can see how the um, progress of these reactions is very different depending on the starting sucrose concentration. Okay, now let's do some graphing. I wanna start by showing you how I created this graph that just shows you the raw data. And uh, first of all, I zoomed in on it. If you wanna zoom back out, you can hover your mouse over the x-axis, use this icon to zoom back out again, and or to zoom out. And uh, again, you can right click and change the axis back to logarithmic if you want to view the data like that. So to create this graph, I'm going to do it in a new file. First of all, I did want to point out that for all of these graphs in this file, there's a lot of information here given in a, uh, a text block that's with in the, in the list of commands at the top of the commands. Uh, and then here, for example, you can see the plot is created with a single plot command and a points command. It's described here. But you can also just look at the commands, hover your mouse, and you can see the commands that are being used. I'm also utilizing a custom legend here and a marker scheme 
to create the different markers for each concentration. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, first of all, I want to do this in a new file. So I'm going to select the data. I can just click the group, the entire group, say edit, copy. Now I have a new file here all ready to go, edit, paste. So now I have all my data and I'm going to start with the plot command. Select both columns, add the plot command. I'm going to make this a dashed line but notice how the lines are kind of going back and forth. I want them to look like discrete lines for each concentration. So to do that, expand the plot command and you can say connect instead of every point, only connect the line as X increases. And that works for this data set. So now these are going to each look like discrete lines for each concentration because you notice that the X axis of time, there's a point when we have a break between each concentration where the x-axis is no longer increasing, it decreases back down. Okay, so that's a little bit of a trick. You could also do masks, but this is a quick way to just get all this data plotted um, like you see here. Now I want to add the points command to, with the different symbols for each concentration. To do that, you could add a points command, but a shortcut here is to click the gear menu on the plot command we already created and say use in points command. Now that I have this, I want to have a different marker type for each concentration of my, my starting sucrose concentration. So I can do that with a marker scheme, expand the points command and see where it says style and it currently is set to uniform. Change this to being a selection of the column that has the starting sucrose concentrations. Now it's going to let you select a marker scheme. We haven't created one yet, so you can say create new scheme. Now if you're used to using the color schemes here for the fills, that will automatically populate a color scheme with all the different options depending on the column you've created. The marker scheme doesn't do that yet, uh, but you can do it pretty quickly by clicking the gear menu on the scheme itself and select unique text values. That's what we want in this case. That will automatically populate this with all the concentrations that we have in our list. Uh, it doesn't change the markers yet, so I still have to go in and the next thing I'm going to do is just change my markers to be unique for each one of these concentrations. Now I've finished with my marker scheme and just a couple of last details here. I probably want to make these points maybe a little bit bigger, just to make them a little easier to see on the screen. I also uh, want to add X and Y titles and if I click on the plus symbol just to the right of my text menu. I'm going to use the X label and the Y label that are connected to my column titles here. So you can see that automatically populates them. Uh, and also changing again the X axis to being logarithmic. The last thing for this graph is to add a legend and we can do that using the custom legend command. That's how we add it when we have a marker scheme. So you go under the label icon up in the toolbar and here it is, custom legend. Go ahead and add that. Expand it out and you'll see how there is a menu here for adding an entry. We're going to select the variable that we created, the marker scheme variable. Uh, we can add a title to this. Uh, let's see what else. I'm going to place this in the lower right corner. I can also make this a little bit narrower. Oh, and the other thing here that's handy is that in the uh, custom legend here for the marker scheme for this variable, we can change the point size independent of the point size for the what's on the graph itself. So that looks a little bit better to increase the point size there. Now I'm back in my example file and we're going to conduct the global fit of this data. There are instructions here right within this note field with the graph itself and I want to point out that there are really three basic steps to getting started. The first one is to select the data that we're going to predict, then we're going to select the variables that this uh, data depends upon and then we're going to add the equation and once we get those three steps done we will have conducted our fit of our data. 
Now there's more involved in evaluating the fit and seeing how good it is. Um, and if you're interested in where this equation comes from, this is the actual equation that we're going to use in the fit that's used in the multivariable fit command. Um, notice it uses a function called Lambert W. In fact, this whole demo really got started because someone contacted us some months ago asking us to add the Lambert W function into Datagraph. Um, I was not familiar with this function. And uh, when I Googled it, I found a lot of information on how Lambert W is useful for solving all sorts of equations, in particular, the Michaelis-Menten equation. And one article I came across that really uh, piqued my interest is cited here, where I document these equations, the integrated Michaelis-Menten rate equation, déjà vu or vu jade. And I just thought that was a great title. Um, this was written in 2013 after that translation of the article uh, was published. Uh, and it's just making the point that uh, we should recognize that there is this form of the equation that we can solve a lot easier than having to do, again, these linearizations or using some type of numerical method to solve these equations. In any case, I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Uh, the link for that article is within this file, but the equation that we're going to use whoops, is right here. This is the actual equation that we're solving. Notice on the left-hand side, this is the same parameter here that we have within our experimental data. And then uh, here, the equation itself uh, actually has two parameters that are substituted. So if you want to see just the list of the parameters that we're actually fitting, it's these three parameters there are the ones that are in the fit for the Michaelis-Menten equation that we're going to do. Now let's fit our data. Click the draw icon in the toolbar and add the multivariable fit command. But actually I want to do this in a new graph. So first add a new graph, then click the draw icon, then add the multivariable fit command. Now for this, we're not pre-selecting any data, but as I said, there's three main steps to conducting this fit. The first one, selecting the data that we're fitting. Here's the column that we're going to fit, and I can use the menu or click and drag right from the header to populate that. Next, we're going to add the data that we're going to, that this parameter depends upon, and that's the two columns that I have here, time and my starting concentration. So first, I can add the time. This goes just below. Here's where I'm going to have both my parameters that this depends upon. Um, click the plus symbol to the right here to add the second parameter. And now let's add in the starting concentration. Now in my equation, I happen to know that the time is represented by the symbol x and the starting concentration is s0. So those are going to be the variables in my equation when I put it in here, which is my third step is to add the proper fit equation. Right now, this is actually set to a linear fit, which you can see is not a good fit to the data. For example, this is um, showing me the difference between the data and the fitted value. We're going to change this to an arbitrary fit. And if I just permit me just for a moment to go back over here to my example file, if you go to Part three, enter the equation. You can then copy this. So we don't have to type this all in. This would be, it took me a little while to, to get this. And then paste that equation in. Now, why don't I see anything yet? Well, I need to have good starting parameters for my value. So you can just use these sliders to kind of change what the value is. And sure enough, now I see a fit of my data. So I'm seeing the, um, the value drawn on the x-axis is whatever is selected with this toggle menu here. So one thing I want to do before I continue is to add my label on my x-axis. And I'm going to do that similar to how I did the first graph. I'm going to select the multivariable command, click on the x label, and then click the y label. There it is. Um, uh, and let's change this also to logarithmic so that we can really see all the data. It really spreads everything out on the x-axis. And what I want to do is to show you how these toggle buttons right here let me change what I'm actually plotting on the x-axis. So I don't have to always plot it based on time. Again, my 
model here is having both time and the starting concentration. So I can change this to actually plot the data according to the starting concentration. It's kind of a cool thing. So I encourage you to kind of play with this in Datagraph. Um, and uh, it took me a little time to kind of get used to thinking about this, but the fact is uh, you could have multiple different parameters. This is, again, a multi-variable fit command. Here I just have the two, but it's really convenient to be able to toggle between these two different parameters in terms of how I view the data. For example, when I plot this based on the starting concentration, it's a little bit easier to see that in particular, here's uh, just a, some of the points that don't fit as well, and these are for the experiment where the starting concentration was the lowest. Okay, so let's leave it for now with the x-axis there. And the other thing that I want to show you is that I actually have the ability with the multivariable command to specify how the data and the fit point are represented. And what I ended up doing in the example file is I actually am not showing the data point through the multivariable command, uh, and I'm showing the fit as a solid point. And the reason I did this is so that I could take the commands from this graphic and actually overlay both the points and the legend. You can just click them and drag them and drop those commands right here. You don't need to do them again. Uh, you do need to move this up to the top so that it's properly being layered. Um, but now this is kind of a nice representation. You can see uh, the different symbols for each of my different uh, concentrations and again, the difference between the fitted value and the original data. In terms of establishing and understanding, uh, is this a good fit? The visual helps a lot, uh, but you can also look at the goodness of fit parameters within the command itself. Now we're in the home stretch and we want to create this final graph that brings everything together. Here we see our raw data and we also see the fitted equation for each one of our concentrations. And I'm drawing this using a function command for each one of the different concentrations that you see here. So let me show you how I set this up. First of all, you can start this by taking the first graph that we created and go ahead and use the clone button to make uh, an exact copy, a clone of this. I'm going to drag this over here to the back. And really what I'm doing here is I'm just, instead of connecting these points with the plot command, again, I'm gonna add a curve that is the fit of each of one of these. So you can go ahead and just delete the plot command. Notice in this case that does disconnect the labels that I had for the X and Y axis, but that's okay. I can switch the command that these are coming from. Now that's working. Now when I add the function command, I'm going to need the value for the variables that come from my fit. So if you go back to your fit and click the gear menu and select extract as variable, and go ahead and here I extract, for example, KP first. Now if you expand that out, what this actually does is creates a number from command variable. It shows you the command it comes from, shows you the value of the variable that it's pulling out. Give it a different name. You can't quite give it the same name because that's gonna cause some problems. But I find it's easiest if I wanna do multiple of these to create one and then clone with holding the option key, clicking and dragging. We'll do one for KS and one for V. And then I'm going to change each of these names. With all of these being unique, now I can go ahead and add my function command here so going to the draw menu, you'll find again towards the bottom, the function command. This is just to graph the function over some range. And we're going to use the same expression that we used in our global fit. So in this section where we have the function form, go ahead and select that, copy it. Now go back here to the function command where we're gonna draw this line and paste it in. When you do, you will see all the unknowns from the equation show up in a list. Now, SO, that's my starting concentration. That is going to be uh, the value that is in, from my experimental data. So for example, here, I'll use the, the, the smallest sucrose concentration. And for these other variables, I'm just going to type in the value that's 
the name that I used in my variable list. Now, there's one, uh, oh, wait, V, it will tell me if it doesn't exist. There we go, V underscore fit. There's one issue here, and that is uh, that I'm using a logarithmic scale, and this is starting at zero. So just change the range to starting at one, for example, and there it is. Now I see the entire fit, um, the line that I get for the entire range of time for concentration equal to 20.8. I can change the color for this, maybe bump up the line width a little bit. And once you have one of these created, it's just a matter of copying and pasting, creating another one, and then I can, um, I, I'm just hovering over here, right clicking, I can copy the concentration or type these in. And I'll do that for each one, so each one gets a line drawn on my graph for each of the concentrations. I hope that this demo will help you to recreate everything that we have in this file, but if not, let us know, reach out. Uh, you can ask us a question in the comments or send us an email through our helpline. Um, but there's one more thing that I need to do because I said I would compare our results to what Michaelis and Menton published. And if you go into the example file, there is a table called results that compares what we got in data graph for these three fit parameters to what Michaelis Menton published, as well as Johnson and Goody also did a reanalysis of the data and Golichnik. This is the paper that we got our formulation from. Um, in this one, they used uh, Mathematica, and we should compare very well, and we do. Uh, and Michaelis and Menton, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing, They, as they talk about in the Johnson & Goody paper, that there was really quite a bit of careful work that they did in terms of calculating these parameters. And, um, and the exact value for Vmax is not something they reported, but if you want to double click on this field, you can see how I'm calculating uh, the Vmax value based on what they published in their paper. In any case, I think it's pretty impressive. And I spent quite a bit of time reading about Maud Menton after uh, delving into this uh, project of, of pulling this data together in this demo. And she clearly was a pretty interesting person. She actually traveled to Germany by herself at the age of 33, supposedly on her own dime, to do this work with Leonor Michaelis. And uh, I thought it was interesting in the sense of the fact that she was the co-author on the paper. That seemed pretty, uh, pretty important and a, a great accomplishment. Uh, she did, after this, go on to get her PhD. She was an MD prior to doing this work and eventually became a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, and yet, even with this accomplishment and many other things she worked on, she's a pretty interesting woman, she did not become a full professor until she was 71 years old, uh, the year that she retired. Anyway, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope that this was useful for you. And of course, if it was, um, please go ahead and give us a like. Thanks.